Sudan to um, celebrate womanhood in Husna Gomez. So it is, it is just the first one. <laughs> and I'm sure it's going to be a great surprise for everyone. And today we have in the house Mike Salonia. Bravo! <laughs> Thank you. Welcome, Mike. Please exit. Can you here with me? For a little bit of moral support. Really? <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, anyway. Uh, Mike, how are um, you? I am good and I am very pleased to be here. Thank We're you very, very much. Happy to have you here. <laughs> very, very excited. Thank you. Oh, well, I am very pleased to be here. Thank you very much. We are all here to acknowledge womanhood and us as women, we applaud ourselves um, because we have been the bravest ones of all. We are the ones that have to take the lift on our shoulders and move on forward. So today we are actually with. Uh, in collaboration with Guzman and Gomez, we're here to do Balance for Better and talk a little bit about my experience. My name is Maite Salonia and I, I want to tell my story, not only as a woman, but I also want to tell my story as a Venezuelan and I also want to tell my story as an immigrant because I'm originally from Venezuela. So I was born and raised in Venezuela and Venezuela is uh, in the South America, the top of South America, we have beautiful Caribbean Sea, we have the mountains, the Amazons, we have a lovely country. But in that said, we also have a country that goes through a lot of challenges from a cultural point of view because it's very much a macho society over there. So throughout time, we have seen that women have not been empowered or you don't see a lot of women in leading teams or in, in power roles because we have always been the ones that have to either stay home to take care of our children or not, not leading the way. So I was really lucky that growing up, my parents pushed me to do whatever I wanted to be, pushed me to study whatever I wanted to study and to be an independent woman. So I ended up studying bachelor's in communications back then and halfway through my major, I started working in an advertising agency. And I'll tell you, advertising in Venezuela, at least, and here from what I've seen, <laughs> um, it's a very male-oriented uh, career. It's, a, it's an industry where there's a lot of men um, leading the teams as well, and women, if they actually go to have children, when they come back, they face a the reality that the long hours and the little working life balance is a bit of a challenge. So. Whilst I was doing that, while I was studying bachelor's in communication and at the same time working in advertising, I was doing really long hours. I was basically working from 9 a.m. in the morning until 5 a.m. Uh, in the evening, and then I headed to university from 6 to 10, and that was my Monday to Friday. So it was really hard what I was trying to do, but it was a very competitive world, and I, I was decisive to make it through. So. Another thing that also stoked me about the situation back home was that as a young independent person, it was hard to survive, it was hard to gain a salary that was covering the cost of living. It, maybe a lot of the Latin Americans here will relate to the way that you sometimes even were, you were 30 years old and you would live with your parents until actually you got married and you lived abroad or like elsewhere because it was really hard to be an independent professional. So you had to make your way along it. And I actually look at Venezuela now, and times are even harder. Um, you see the crisis of what, what people are going through, and you see how women and children are the ones that are more affected. Venezuela is at the moment from the South American countries, <coughs> the one that has the, mo the most <coughs> amount of teenage girls that are um, either pregnant or sexually active and therefore getting pregnant at a really early age. So th they're suffering in many, many, many ways. And Venezuela is going through one of the human rights crises that, that has been the one of the most worst ones at the moment. And the ones that are most affected are women. And you would see that. Uh, it's, it's very sad. I was reading an article the, the other day that was telling me that women are now, there's a lack of food, there's a lack of medicine over there at the moment, so you would see that m women don't even have pads, menstrual pads, or tampons accessible, so they would trade whatever they had on f with food related 
to have something for their men menstrual needs or their birth pills. So it's, it's a hard situation back then. I must admit that I was really lucky that I left Venezuela that 10 years ago and I migrated. I said at that time, look, I, I needed to be resourceful. I needed to be, sorry, I needed to, to see what I could do, what I could do as a young professional. I decided that it was time for me to migrate. It was time for me to take my nationality, my Venezuelanism, my idiosyncrasy, and take all of that with me. And I will always be a Venezuelan, but I will have to move from there. So I decided to gather all the savings that I had, and I moved to Barcelona when I was only 23. So it was hard as well, because I arrived there 23 year old, 23 year old, <laughs> um, and I, I said, well, I speak Spanish. I have three years in the industry and I had working permits. So you know what? It's easy. Let's go. Let's conquer the world. When I arrived there, I was kindly shocked <laughs> because I understood that it was the beginning of the economic crisis in Spain. And at that time, there were no jobs, not for me, not for anybody, really. Um, and the Spanish people was going through a really hard time. So all that effort that I made to leave Venezuela and just grab all the little things that I had and leave, well, I had to question myself. I said, well, look, what, I, what do I need to do? Like, I enrolled myself in a three-month course of new media, and I said, well, look, I'll try through here to do anything I can. If I can do anything, I'll, I'll make it work. If I can't, then I'll have to be resourceful again and just try to reinvent myself. I put my priorities into place. I said, what do I want to do? What is my major goal here? I want to work in communications. I want to make myself away through my professional career. So how do I actually get there in a, in a country where we have a crisis? I worked on anything I could to save a bit of money and I ended up studying in a master's degree in um, creative communications and management of creative teams. And I said to myself, well, look, I'll, this I, it was an investment for my career and I wanted to lead the way. I, I needed to make my way in a professional career. And I, that took me two years of hard work in Spain until I decided to reevaluate everything again and say, this is not working. The crisis is too hard. And as a 25 year old, I was just not going heading anywhere from there. So it was crushing. It was crushing my dreams. It was hard to understand. And at that point, I said, I needed to be resilient. I needed to step up put myself up together and plan out what else could I do. So I decided to move from Spain and head to Australia, which is, I must admit, one of the best things I have ever done. <laughs> um, so I'm pretty pleased to be here, yeah. I arrived to Australia and it was, it was facing the reality that I was an immigrant again, but I was an immigrant in a country that didn't speak my language, so I had to see, well, evaluate, was my English all right? I, I questioned myself in so many ways. I said, well, look, am I, am I enough? Is my English enough? I like, guess my curriculum enough? Will I be able to make it here as an immigrant? It was a harder task as well. So um, time went by and I decided to, you know what? I said, I am gonna focus on finding a job here on what I want. I want to focus on my passion, which was communications. And I spent the first three weeks of arriving into Sydney just polishing my English, putting together my CV, heading into interviews, and just giving it a go. I was terrified. I went to interviews, and then after the interview, I went back home saying, how could I have said that? You know, like, oh my God, my English is so bad. I, 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 I was my, my, my biggest critic. But at, by the end of the day, that was incorrect because somebody did give me an opportunity. Somebody believed in me and gave me that first local experience here. And that for me was the world. After he said, you know what, you're going to come here and you're going to work in our digital agency as an account manager, I was stoked. I couldn't even believe it. I said, you know what, I, I can do this. I can do this. You know, it's not that hard. You are your biggest critic by the end of the day. So you are the one that pulls you down, but you are the one that needs to pull you up as well. So 
beautiful. I had one year to freelance um, in communications, and then from there figure out if I wanted to stay in Australia, I needed to figure out how to do it. So I did. I freelanced for, um, in two different agencies, and then I got to a point where I said, if I want to stay, I need to do some regional farm work. All right, well, what do I need to do now? <laughs> well, I, I grabbed my things, and I went, I needed to be brave in that moment. So I grabbed my things and I went to milk, far, uh, milk goats at a goat farm for three months. One of the hardest things I've ever done. I had to wake up at 4.30 in the morning, milk 750 goats, and even then after that, I was able to have breakfast. So I was dying by then, I, I, by then I milked 750 goats. And that was three months of hard work. So it was good, but I had to be courageous and I had to be brave. I, it also gave me a lot of appreciation for the farmers and for understanding how the food actually arrives to my table. You know, Those are people that work from Monday to Monday. And I was there like suffering, my hands suffered, my, like, just from milking the goats and just, I was tired, but I needed to, I needed to understand that I had a goal that was staying here and I needed to be perseverant in that way. So I was perseverant. I made it through my three months and I came back to Sydney. And then once I came back to Sydney, I said, all right, it's time to do it all over again. But this time I not only found a really good job that I was really proud of myself, I also got my sponsorship. So that meant that -ching, I was able to stay here. So it was really good because heading back to Venezuela was not an option for me. It was really not an option. Things were really bad over there at the moment. And it was just, what do I do? You know, I, I was a bit of alone and trying to make it. So I was so, so, so happy that I found that job. And it was an account management job. So it was directly on my line of work. And I felt much better. I felt that I, all that hard work and all that effort that I did had paid off. Uh, the difference in this time is that I was working in an Australian agency that was working for an Asian market. And so there were a lot of cultural challenges that I had in that time because not only I was working for an Australian agency, so I had to put my hat on as an Australian person, I also had to understand that I was working for Asian market. So I had to understand how the Asian market was working. And as a Latin woman as well, I had to understand what's my position in there. And I was working with cigarettes, which is a bit of a no-no now for me, but that, well, that was the account that I had. And I just said, you know what, I'm gonna make the best out of this. But how do I work in an environment or in an industry that was cigarettes and there was predominantly male again? And not only predominantly male, but it, there's a lot of egos in that industry. And I was the only girl on the team. I was the only woman in the team. And I had to make my voice. I had to make myself lead the team and, and make it worth. How many people in the team? Um, we were about 10 on our closest team and it was an agency of around 60, 70 people. So, and then we had to work with a lot of countries. So we worked with around 15 countries in Asia. So it, it, very hard, very hard. I did at the time. No, it's a fair enough question. I did at the time. I... <laughs> No, but I did. I did at a time, and um, it was also my way out. And it's a bit of a parenthesis from the, the talk, but for me, see, in Asia, it's cultural that people smoke. So you would see children smoking. And for me, it was super shocking to the point where I said, you know what, this, 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 I just don't want anything to do with it. And actually, I left that agency because I was ethically disturbed so by the... Yeah, my values didn't align in that way. And I had to be real with myself. I had to understand that if I was working in a place where I didn't want it to work because the values were not aligned with what I thought or what I didn't want it to be there, you know? And I had the opportunity because 
time went by and I managed to, well, a lot of time went by, about around seven years after that. Um, and I managed to finally get my citizenship. And I managed to say, you know what? I, I don't need to be in this, uh, like in this line of work if, I, if it doesn't, if it doesn't fit in with me. So I decided to leave, but I was a really happy Australian by then. And I, it was good. Life was, was smiling at me in that way. After that, but I think uh, after that, I, I met Rafa, my love, and <laughs> <laughs> and everything was going from an emotional point of view, everything was going really well. Yet still, I didn't felt all right. I was feeling that I was losing passion for what I was doing. I was feeling down. I was somatizing a lot of sickness into my, my health was not all right. I was having sleeping deprivations. I was having a tough time coping with stress. And I think that all that effort that had built up during time to get to that point had actually taken a big toll on me. So I said, well, what was happening? I needed to stop and reevaluate everything again and say, well, what do I do? And I understood that I was good from an emotional point of view, but I was unhappy with all what I was doing from a professional point of view. And I decided that it was time to make a big shift. It was time to make a big change again. And I went back to my mantras and said, you know what, Maite? There's nothing you can't do. You have to be perseverant, you have to be resilient, and you have to be resourceful to find your own way and just keep on going. So I did that. And Rafa and I decided to quit our jobs, quit our corporate jobs, and put together a little dream that we have. And it's a bit of an oily dream. <laughs> so we put together our business, which is Olu Life. And I'll show you a little bit what that is. Olu Life, we decided that we wanted to help others in a way on how we were affected. So everything that we wanted to create needed to be aligned with what we believe. We needed to be real as a company. We needed to be honest and true to ourselves. And we wanted to have social um, well-being. We wanted to help people try to gain, like, gain their dreams, but it's not like, oh yeah, let's gain our dreams. It's like, how do we get there? It's if you're feeling stress, understanding how you can manage stressful situations, how you can rebalance yourself, how can you have a more natural living approach in life as well. So in that way, that's everything that we wanted to create with our brand. So we decided to do different easy to use products that people can utilize on their day to day base and find mindfulness and balance in their everyday. And it's, you know what it has been an incredible journey. We launched our brand, uh, it was about April 2018, and it was a really beautiful journey so far. But I won't lie to you, I had to go back to those mantras a lot of times to say, Maita, you have to be resilient, you have to be preservant, and you have to be resourceful to get through. Because it's not easy to be an entrepreneur, it's not easy to have financial stability, it's not easy to work with your partner. <laughs> no, but it's, um, and you have to be a person with many hats. You have to be a person that ha has an understanding of where you want to go, have a goal and, and aim for that. So now I can say that we have been through tough times. We have done many things and we are at a point where we are the most incredibly happy where we have been. So we're happy, and we're good, and we're solid. And I can now stand here in front of you today and say, you know what, I'm actually incredibly like, proud of myself. In my own little world, in a, in a really humble um, space, but I am proud, because not only as a woman, but also as an immigrant, and also as a Venezuelan. The story of my life is to say, you know what, there's nothing we can't do, but we just have to Make sure we know what we want and push through and do it all. So based on today and based on that little story that I hope I have inspired you as well to just keep on going in your life, the team of Guzman and Gomez also wanted to help, like 
have me here and also wanted to give you and retribute you as women and all for all the hard work that you have done. So I'm very pleased that I am here and I'm very pleased to tell my story in that way. Thank you very much. <laughs>